newsletter, the Liberator Online. Um, it's 40,000 that are on that are on the Libertarian Online now. Um, Sharon was one of the three finalists for the National LP's Thomas Paine Award for an Outstanding Libertarian Communicator. That was selected by the members of the party and presented at the 2000 Libertarian National Convention. She's been active in the Libertarian movement since the 1970s, which I find hard to believe because there's no way that she's old enough to have been involved in the 70s. <laughs> I also find this next statement from your bio to be completely unbelievable as well, but it says that in 1972 she was a founding member of the Libertarian Party of Georgia. Again, I don't think that's all right. In 1988, she was the campaign manager for the uh, Libertarian Party of Georgia's three Public Service Commission candidates, historic campaigns that won statewide ballot access for the party, and in 1990, she served as an aide and consultant for the party's gubernatorial campaign. In 1994, she finally decided to run for office. She was Libertarian Party of Georgia's uh, nominee candidate for Commissioner of Agriculture, receiving 23% of the vote statewide, and 34% of the vote in three metro Atlanta counties for a total of over 300,000 votes. Also in 1994, <laughs> she was one of the plaintiffs against the state of Georgia which challenged the constitutionality of a Georgia law that required candidates for office to take a drug test. That case went all the way to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, where Georgia Libertarian Attorney Walker Chandler, who I'm sure many of you have had an opportunity to meet, won the case thus overturning the law. An expert in libertarian communication, Sharon holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's degree in counseling and educational psychology. She lives in Rydell, Georgia, with her husband, libertarian writer and editor, James W. Harris, and her 93-year-old mother. She has a grown daughter who I had the opportunity to meet at this last uh, Libertarian National Convention in St. Louis. She had, and three perfect grandchildren. I get to you guys, Sharon Harris. <laughs> Uh, 
And, and now, at this point, we're at a pivotal, we're at a pivotal place in history with the libertarian movement. Uh, one that Reason Magazine has called the libertarian moment. And I really do believe that we are in the libertarian moment now. We are in the time when we really have the opportunity to create a surge for our ideas. And I'm really excited about that. A uh, poll after poll tells us that people are angry. I mean, the Republicans have so messed everything up that everyone is angry with the government. And they really do want government to get out of their lives. We see this in the Tea Party movement. It's a good example of people who just suddenly started getting involved in politics because they were angry and they didn't like the status quo. They didn't like what was happening. And they're out there protesting and they, and, and guess what? Probably at least a third of them are really libertarians. They're really libertarians in their heart and they just don't know there's a name for what they believe. And so here's a whole new group of prospects for the Libertarian Party and I really urge you to go out there and talk to these people and let them know that there are other people who agree with them. Um, the, party, the Tea Party movement, of course, as you know, is not a consistent movement. Uh, there are probably a third of the people there who you might call neocons almost. Uh, probably a third of them are social conservatives. Um, but about a third of them, I believe, really are libertarians. And when they go to a place where there's a full smallest political quiz for them to take, when they come up to take it and you ask them, well, what do you call yourself? Almost always they say they call themselves conservative. And maybe 2% of them will actually say I'm a libertarian. But then when they take the test, guess what they score? In the libertarian quadrant. And which means that they may not be full-fledged libertarians yet, but they at least have a tendency toward libertarianism. And libertarianism is the thing that they agree with most, and libertarians agree with them the most. And so we have this great, huge number of people now. Um, just think, what if 30% of them are libertarian? What if they join the Libertarian Party? That would be a cool idea, wouldn't it? But speaking of the tea parties, I do have to share with you a story. That a gentleman who's involved in the tea party movement in the Northeast sent, sent out an email to people, and he was telling them about the party they were going to have on um, tax day and everything, and inviting everybody to come. And then he said this. He said, one question. Would you happen to know how we, as Tea Party members, can be acknowledged by the Board of Elections and be listed as a viable party on the ballot? Um, yeah, you just, you know, you just call the Secretary of State and tell them your party and they'll just put you on the ballot, right? <laughs> we, I mean, I had to laugh out loud when I read this because it was like, he has no clue. <laughs> he has no clue. Um, that, and that's true of just about everybody on the street if you ask them. They have no idea about ballot access laws and what happens, how you get to be on the ballot and everything. We can tell them a few things. I'll teach them a few things about that. Uh, the um, USA Today um, um, did a survey and showed that 60% of people said that they had, would prefer to vote for someone who has never been in Congress before. 60% of the people. The word libertarian is getting out there all over the place, regularly on television, anytime, just about any time you turn on the TV, you'll see somebody who's talking about, actually talking about these ideas and using the word libertarian in a very positive way a lot of the time. Um, in Time Magazine about a year ago, they had an article about Ron Paul, and in the article, they described him as libertarian, and they used the word libertarian. And then they said, well, America is moving in his direction. Which basically, from their article, America is moving in a libertarian direction. When Pew Research did their research on different words and how people, whether people thought they were positive or negative, 38% of the people found libertarian a positive word. And just think about that, that most people 30 years ago, I never heard the word libertarian, and now 38% of the people immediately said they saw it as a positive word. 
So we've got a huge constituency out there just ready to, once they know that there is such a thing as libertarian, and that there's a word for what they believe in, and that there are other people who agree with them. So this is, this is the really good news, that we're, we're starting to, to have an impact that people know about us, know what we are, and so forth. And they're starting to take us much more seriously. But there's a drawback to this to a certain extent, and that is that now we are being, now that we're being taken seriously, we are seen as more of a threat. So consequently, people will start fighting us more. They will start demanding of us to, we will have to be better at what we do to tell them about what we believe and to give them the case for liberty because we will we'll get the opportunity to do it, but people will take us more seriously and therefore they will attack us more broadly than they've ever done before. But remember what Gandhi said, if you've ever heard the quote from Gandhi, he says, first they ignore you, then they make fun of you, then they attack you, and then you win. And I believe that we can do that. But if we are going to win and take advantage of this great libertarian moment, there are things that we have to do in order to make that happen. There are a lot of things that we have to do. But what I'd like to share with you today is three big ideas are three major challenges that I would like to put before you to ask you to, to do in helping us to take advantage of this winning moment. And these are things that require, that may require some of you to get outside of your comfort zone, to do things that you're maybe not used to doing, maybe you've gotten a little bit comfortable doing what you're doing, or talking the way you're doing about libertarianism, and maybe you need to step out a little bit out of your comfort zone in order to accomplish these things. The first thing I would like to ask you to do, and that I think is very, very important for libertarians, is that we distinguish ourselves from conservatives. Now, it's very tempting to want to sound like a conservative because conservatism is sort of popular, or it's at least conceived as popular. And we have been thought of for a long time as part of the right wing. And a lot of people think we're just another little brand of conservatism. And we sometimes sound like conservatives because we talk about some of the same things when we talk about the free market and so forth. We do sometimes sound like conservatives. But I think it's very important that we distinguish ourselves from them because, because they're not libertarian. And conservatives may agree with us on some things. Uh, sometimes they do. And I clearly do agree with some of the other speakers earlier that we should, should certainly work with conservatives, Tea Party people, anybody who has a particular issue that we agree on. I think it's great for us to work together. I think it's wonderful. But I think that we need to make it very clear when we're talking to people one-on-one -on -one and, with, and with the media that we are not conservatives. Um, how are conservatives different from us? I mean, they are different from us in a lot of ways. They tend to want to prop up big corporations that are their buddies. Uh, they tend to want to have military intervention all around the world. Uh, they tend to want to tell you what you can do in the privacy of your own bedroom. They want to tell you what you can smoke, what you can eat, what you can drink. Um, regardless of what they say, when they get in power, they build bigger government. And when we think about it, is there really such a thing as a conservative? Um, look at the people who call themselves conservative. You got Sarah Palin, you got John McCain, you got Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, National Review Magazine. Um, uh, uh, you've got uh, George W. Bush, you've got Mitt Romney, you've got David Brooks of the New York Times. And they don't agree with each other. <laughs> they're very different from each other. So they've kind of got a crisis of definition that they're facing, that they don't really know what a conservative is. And the reason we tend to think sometimes that we are kind of aligned with them is because of our belief in the free market. And they claim to be believers in the free market. And I'm just wondering how somebody can be 
in favor of the free market when they think that if I sell him a marijuana cigarette and he smokes it, we both can go to jail. That's a sale that takes place in the marketplace. And as long as they don't feel like we have the right to exchange goods and services in the marketplace, they really don't believe in free enterprise. They don't really believe in free market. And when, again, when they get in power, they build bigger government. We don't want to be part of them. We want to replace them with something better. We, we really have the opportunity to replace them with something that really is truly free market and really does believe in human liberty, which they don't seem to do. And I'm not saying that average people necessarily, some average people who call themselves conservative, really do believe in liberty. And probably 30% of Republicans are really not conservatives, they are libertarian. They just don't know it yet. They don't know there's a word for it, or they think the word is, might not work to their advantage or whatever, so they call themselves conservative. But conservatism is not a philosophy that believes in individual liberty. So, uh, and the, the powers that be who are conservatives do not uphold the ideals of, of um, individual liberty. So, when we allow somebody to call us fiscally conservative, it's kind of giving them too much credit, don't you think? I mean, really, in fact, when conservatives or people who call themselves conservative actually do believe in the free market, they're a libertarian on that issue. So perhaps we should start saying that some conservatives are fiscally, con fiscally libertarian rather than we are fiscally conservative. So I think it's real important that we distinguish from, the, from them. When we find that, that people who agree with us on free market things, will be, they, can be, they can score conservative by agreeing on that. But what we can say instead is that in the areas where they really do believe in free markets, they are libertarian on free market issues, on economic issues. They are libertarian. And when liberals actually really do believe in civil liberties and personal liberties and free speech, they're not liberal on those issues, they're libertarian on those issues. We are the ones that are consistent across the board. We believe in liberty on both sides of the equation, in economics and in personal liberties. So we can, we can show them that we're kind of the denominator, we're the, we're the one that's across the board, and they agree with us about half of the time, if they really do believe in liberty in whatever way that they do. So I said, that's one of the things that I think is really important for us because I think it's hurting us more now than ever before to be associated with conservatives because they're going to crash and burn. They're going to really be, they're going to really disappoint the Tea Party people who voted for them thinking that they would bring about smaller government and more liberty. They're going to be very disappointed and they're going to be looking for somewhere, where else can we go? And you stand here ready for them with open arms that, hey, you're a libertarian, come and join us and really fight for true liberty and for, for libertarian ideals. The second thing that libertarians, I think, need to do more than we do, and that is to brand the word libertarian, to use the word libertarian. Now, we have the Libertarian Party, and that is a wonderful thing. In fact, I'm so glad that the party named itself the Libertarian Party and kept the name Libertarian Party because what happened as a result of that, it kept the word alive. That's one of the major accomplishments of the Libertarian Party is the word has stayed alive when a lot of organizations, a lot of libertarian organizations, quit using the word. And they started calling themselves market liberals or free marketeers or uh, whatever they might choose to call themselves, but they didn't use the word libertarian because they thought it wasn't catchy or it wasn't fun or it wasn't popular or whatever. But because the Libertarian Party had that name and that standard bearer of that name, and because I think too it's in some measure it's because the Libertarian was on the world's smallest political quiz, which shows up all over the place, that those two places people saw the word libertarian. And now it's become so popular that everybody's jumping on the bandwagon and everybody wants to use that. And all the libertarian think tanks and all now do call themselves libertarian. So it's all out of the, you know, just all out of the closet, the word libertarian. 
And what we tend to do sometimes, I think, is when we're talking about a particular issue, we might say, we might give a really good libertarian solution to a problem or something, but if we don't say this is a libertarian idea, this is a libertarian solution, then the person who hears that idea and thinks it's a good idea, they don't know that they can find other good ideas in the same place, that libertarians have good ideas not just on that area, but they have good ideas in a lot of areas. It's like McDonald's, if they just said hamburgers. They, they don't call their hamburgers hamburgers. They're McDonald's hamburgers. They brand their name and advertise their name because they're proud of it, because they want people to come back. They want people to have some more of their products. Uh, we need to brand libertarianism the same way, and we need to always use it. When you write a letter to the editor, if you have a solution to a problem, say, this is a libertarian solution. As a libertarian, I think such and such. If you call in a radio talk show, Always use the word libertarian and just get it out there because it's a it's a it's a cool word now. People really like it and they want to be libertarians. They want to call themselves libertarians. We have more problem now with used to no no celebrity would call themselves libertarian and now a lot of them call themselves libertarians who are not even libertarians because they know that it's a cool thing. So they they like to call themselves libertarian. And so we can, and we can say to them again, you know, I'm glad you're a libertarian on that particular issue, even if they don't agree with you on other things. People, people generally, most people are a libertarian on something. You know, there's you will seldom find anyone who is non-libertarian on every issue. That would be a very peculiar person. You know, you would seldom <laughs> find them. So most people are libertarian on some issues, and especially the issues that mean the most to them too. They tend to be because we have that heritage of liberty in, in America. So we, we find people being libertarian on issues that they never thought about being libertarian on. We need to be proud of being libertarian. We need to use the word all the time and, and encourage other people to use it as well or whatever issue that they agree with us on. The third thing that I would like to, for everyone to consider doing is that is to meet the issues head on, boldly, without compromise, because we don't need to compromise anymore. We have the ideas that people are looking for. And if we compromise on those ideas or water them down, we end up just sounding like any other politician. We just sound like um, anybody else who's running for office or something. And what benefit does that give us? It just, it just helps the other guy, that we sound like them and they like us, so they vote for the other guy. But, it's, but people who are really libertarian and who really like these ideas, we put them out there, they will come to us. They will come and want to know more and want to get involved in what we're doing. So we need to do that and represent libertarianism in a positive way. Still, even as far as we've come, a lot of us, a lot of people you meet, you will be the first libertarian that they ever met. And you will, whether you like it or not, be representing libertarians. And we as individualists, we don't want to be like part of a group or something sometimes, but we really are. We are part of the libertarian movement. And so when we speak for libertarianism, people think we represent all libertarians. So we can do that. We can represent libertarians because we know what those ideas are. And what we can do is learn about them, become an expert in them, you know the questions you're going to be asked when you go out there. Learn those questions. Learn the answers to them. And you don't have to reinvent the answers because people have already written them. Libertarians are very good at, at these issues and learning these issues. And the answers are available for you. And you can always say, you know, I don't know the answer right now, but I'll find out for you if you don't have an answer for something. But you don't have to start sounding like a liberal or a conservative when you go out there. We have different we have a better answer to all of these to all of these issues. So we don't need to be evasive. We don't need to compromise our philosophy. But what we do need is learn is to learn to be persuasive and learn to say things in a way where people can understand them and hear what we're having to say. And so the other thing we need to learn is communication techniques. We need to learn how to say these things in a way that other people will be able to understand and will will grasp, not only grasp, but will like the idea and will become persuaded to become libertarian. And at the Advocates, we can help you with some of those things because we've done a lot of research on 
how to communicate these ideas and, and um, in a more effective way, in a more persuasive way. We have, we're seeing so much need for liberty now in the world. You know, the whole history of civilization, the advancement of civilization has all been the road to individual liberty. Every time human beings have become freer, every time we've separated something from the government, the world has progressed. Things have gotten better for everyone. And it's a, it, it's a thing that we're, we're involved in something that's really important, that's really wonderful. We have an idea that I believe that idea has come, and there's nothing more powerful than an idea who has come. If you'll see this little piece of concrete right here, it just looks like a, just an ordinary little piece of concrete, but it happens to be a piece of concrete that used to be part of a very large wall, the Berlin Wall. And that wall, for decades, and for decades, that evil symbol of totalitarianism stood seemingly as permanent as the Great Pyramids. And then all of a sudden, just all of a sudden, one magical day, it just all fell apart. It just all fell apart. The concrete was still just as strong as it had ever been. The barbed wire that was on top of it was just as sharp as it had ever been. The weapons that the guards held in their hands still had bullets in them, were still as powerful as they ever be. What happened? What happened to that wall? Well, it had been held together by an idea. And when that idea disappeared, the wall fell apart because nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we're seeing that idea's time coming now all around the world where people are longing to be free, where they're saying, we're seeing other Berlin walls falling. And that's what we're about, is helping those walls to fall. Because we have an idea that can make all those walls fall. And all that barbed wire and all those weapons can fall because of an idea. And what we're involved in is a cause that is literally the great cause that makes all other great causes possible. I mean, if you think about it, everywhere around the world where there is where there's no liberty, there's poverty. There's violence, there's unhappiness, and where there's liberty, there's the ability to follow your dream. People have a chance to follow their dreams. And then all the causes that they want to help, whether it be helping the poor, whether it be helping animals, whether it be painting art, all the great causes, all the great causes, medical advancements, all of those great causes are made possible by the great cause that we're involved in. The great cause that we are making possible. That we, it's our legacy that we are leaving for the world. That's a pretty big job. But it's well worth it, don't you think? I mean, think about it. It's nothing less than the anti-slavery movement that we're involved in to get rid of human slavery and to bring about human liberty. So, I'm going to say like uh, David Berglund once said, he said, um, you know, not to lay a lot of pressure on you guys or anything, but the whole future of Western civilization depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're up for it. Okay, thank you.